The following production is brought to you by the Talkin' Buds Leaf Show. Here we go, Talkin' Buds Leaf Show. We started last week sort of saying, like, tapping out on the regular season. Because it is long. It goes on. It's about, I think, the fact that the playoffs are starting in, like, late April, the 20th of April, is is absurd to me. But I gotta say, I'm sitting watching them play the Detroit Red Wings on Hockey Night in Canada, and I'm going, you know what? This season has been long, but it's there's been a lot of great storylines. Here. There's been a lot of different things that we can sink our teeth into if you're creating content for this team. Like Austin, Ma- like even look at right now, Austin Matthews chase for 70 goals. The goaltending debate of who's getting game one just won't die. Like what we all anointed Samson off, he looked like he was ready to take it. And then the entire game against the Devils, the entire second game against the Devils, and the first period against the Red Wings, we're sitting there going, oh man. This isn't over yet. Nick Robertson, guy who we're all like, there's no way you're playing in the playoffs, showing the ability to score, which is something this team has lacked in the playoffs every year. The defense, who's playing on defense, which six guys is Sheldon Heath going to throw out there. There's a lot of different things sort of in the hopper for us to discuss heading into game one. God forbid any goalie on this team gives up any sort of bad goal because it's amazing how we sat here last week being like Samsonov is number one. But and then he, he gives up way his his record since he's come back from his little hiatus has is unbelievable. And it's just so funny how and I understand it's a very sensitive topic because goaltending is just a sensitive topic for any team, really. But it's I just find it funny how a week ago we were sitting here and we were like, he's the number one guy. And then he has he's kind of a you know what? They, they, they had some breakdowns. He gave up a couple like oh, like bad goals, I guess. And now it's just it's just completely flipped. It's just completely flipped. I think the thing with Samsonov is he's been excellent since coming back from his little hiatus. He was so so bad to start the year this year. So bad, and he kind of showed to be Jack Campbell type, where you can tell his confidence is a very fragile thing. And I think when you watch him get shelled like he did against the Devils and then start of the game against the Red Wings, you're kind of going, oh, no. Is this guy going to lose his confidence at the exact worst time, right? That, like, there's no worse time for this guy to lose his confidence because Joe Wall is a guy who whose play is struggling because I think he's losing confidence. You got Martin Jones. Matt Murray made a start for the Marlies. It didn't, it didn't go that well from what I saw on Twitter last night, or went okay from what I saw on Twitter last night, but we'll give we'll cut Matt Murray a break. He hasn't played hockey in a really long time. So you're like, you're feeling good about Samsonov because you're like, look at this guy. He's, he's rounding into form. He's assuming the role as the number one goalie, and then this happens, and you're just kind of like, no, dude, please, please don't lose your confidence and go into the tank with two games left to play in the season. Yeah, I get that. that that's, that's a fair point, but I just... I, I just this is like a whole other podcast, separate conversation, kind of a nerdy topic. But like, what what is the allowance for like, quote unquote, bad goals for a goaltender? Because it just seems like any time anyone on this team who's playing net gives up any sort of goal that is deemed to be a goal that they should have had. It, it's like, it's, it's just instant. It just, it flips just like that. All of a sudden, the guy's a bum. And I just feel like I maybe I'm just a goalie sympathizer because I do think it's the hardest position, one of the hardest positions in sports. But like I just have a way bigger tolerance for goalies just like having a bad night, having a bad game. Like this guy's been really good for a long time. But I what you're saying is true. It's it's just you're worried about the confidence. But I don't know. He's been good for a while. He won them a series last year. He didn't even lose the series against Florida. He got hurt. He's clearly still the guy because at the end of the first against the Red Wings, everyone was like, "Let's let's pull this guy and put Joe Wall in." I'm sorry, they they yeah. they had some brute like Morgan Riley pinned like trying to be the third man in on a nothing play going down the wing, and then he, he gets caught going back the other way. 
And then on the power play, there's to bring it just wide open. Like it's, I don't know. Like I, I just, I don't know. I maybe, maybe you can label me a goalie sympathizer. No, you, you're, you've been labeled a goalie sympathizer for a long time now. Yeah. There's no, that isn't a new thing. I just think, like I said, that everyone's confidence is a bit shaky because he looked so bad to start the year. Yeah. Like, remember how bad he looked to yeah, start he was the year? Yeah, yeah, right? Awful, like, he couldn't yeah, he, he couldn't so make bad. a save, right? So everybody's just yeah. kind of a little bit worried that... Because it doesn't matter who you have in the lineup to start game one. If, if, if you can't get a save, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how well you play. If he... If, if Samsonov is not in peak tip top shape to start that series it's it's not going to go well and that's what everyone's so afraid of yeah i mean you could also make the argument that goaltending's never really been their number one issue in the playoffs though so well, like that's that's where i that's where my head's at it's like obviously i want to be confident with my goaltender going forward but we don't have a vasilevsky we don't have a Bobrovsky. this is what we have to work with so i wanted to to start with the matthew 70 goal chase but we're just organically started talking about goaltending, and now that's going to lead into defense. I think this is a huge topic of conversation going into the playoffs. It's who, honestly, let's let's just say it: should TJ Brody play in the playoffs? And I think we know what Sheldon Keefe's answer to that will be. But I've I've seriously gotten to a point where I don't know if it's a good idea to have him play in the playoffs. He's he's just had he's had a really 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 tough year. And he's on the ice for a lot of goals against. How many times have you watched them get scored on this year and then they cut to the replay and there's TJ Brody being soft or out of position or turning the puck over? And I understand, I think this is a it's a really tough decision because he's a veteran guy. He's been really good since he showed up here for the first like four years of his deal. He was like a like staple in their top two. But this season, it's been a struggle for him. And I really think with with all these extra bodies they have on defense now, we still have Joel Edmondson coming back at some point. I just I wish there was a better odd. Uh, what makes this conversation difficult for me is I wish there was people just like forcing him out. Just being like, these guys are playing so well that... They're forcing him out. And you actually could make that argument for Benoit because when Edmondson came in, Benoit got thrown to the side. And then ever since he's come back in, it's like, you can't take this guy out. Like, I know he made some, he can make the odd mistake. There was one the other night, but you can't, you can't look away from the way he punishes dudes coming down his side. Like he always finished his check, but I just, I just wish there was a, I don't know. Like I, 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 he has had a brutal year. I've never been a huge fan. He's but he's been he's he's been an okay leaf for his tenure. But it's just like I don't feel good about anyone going in there. It, it's if there was a, clearly another guy where I was like, "Hey, you have to put him because of this." And I think Benoit's kind of done that. But it, like it's just I don't know Joel Edmondson that well. Like I don't know. Like the guy's been guys and played. What I'm, about, I'm I'm like I don't know. What about What about Giordano? Giordano was brutal last year in the play. He was awful well, in the playoffs last year. He was, but granted, he has not played nearly as much this year as he has played last year. I'm not sitting here saying Giordano over Brody is the definitive right thing. I'm just saying to me, like, those two guys are kind of similar in the sense that, like, they're both veteran guys that, like, you want their veteran presence and leadership on the ice and experience, but at the same time, they're both, they've both been pretty mistake prone this year. I don't know. The one thing I'll give. Mark Giordano over TJ Brody is Mark Giordano seems like he's the only defenseman other than Morgan Riley who can like shoot the puck in the net. Yeah. But I just, I, 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 this is a, there's no right answer here for me. Like, this is just, you don't love Brody's game, so you want him out. But like, I, I don't feel confident with Mark Giordano. I don't feel confident, that confident with Joel Edmondson. They have their ups and downs. Brody is just slowed down. He he used to make smart plays with the puck, but now it just seems like he's lost a step, so he can't move the puck fast enough. Mark Giordano, same thing, but he's got a little more offensive upside, and he's a leader. And he's a leader, guy. and you can yeah. you've seen him get emotional and drop the mitts. So like that that's a big thing. And then Joel Edmondson's just a big guy who can clear front of the net, but he's not he's not moving the puck too quickly anyway. So no. it's just kind of like take your pick. I think you you go with who you go with game one. 
and then see what the vibe is. It's kind of with Ryan Reeves, too. It's like Ryan Reeves starts game one against Florida because you need his presence in the lineup. But eventually, if you get to a point where that's that part of the series has kind of subsided, which I don't really see happening against Florida, but take him out. Maybe you need Noah Gregor in there to to provide some speed for that fourth line. It's it's I don't want to get too let's not get married to what the game one lineup is. We're gonna he's gonna Sheldon Keefe's gonna make the decision on who's gonna start. And guess what? If it doesn't work, they can just change it the next game. Yeah. Well, hopefully, I don't know. I think you worried them about them falling behind in a series. It's kind of, I don't know. Who had on their bingo card this year heading into the playoffs that the defense pairing you felt the best about is Jake McCabe and Simone Benoit? Jake McCabe is right now is probably ice on his face with stitches. Oh, that, that was. Every, like He was bleeding yeah he was he was yeah, bleeding. He, he was bleeding he said man. after the game that he that he thought he was okay it, and, and that it was just swelling and that's yeah, why he's he probably fine back. that guy god listen, that man, guy's got a sore face we poke we poke tons of fun at kyle dubas and the guys kyle dubas brought in all the time have jake mccabe for part of last year this year and next year for two million bucks on your cap is one of the best moves kyle dubas ever made in his and you're as Maple Leafs GM. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I wish I had a great answer for this, for who should start. Like, I don't even like Lil, like, is Lilligren penciled in there? Like, I think they want him to be. He got, I think he got they want rocked him to be. last night. He's small. He's, he's been brutal. Like, he's kind of been the odd man. He didn't play last year in the playoffs. Well, they, I, like, but you could sit here and poke holes in their defense all know, night long. This is like, why I don't like, feel confident yeah. with anybody. Like, like, like Labushkin. Like, Labushkin is it brings he's he's a good partner for Riley. He brings uh, a, a physical element to the to the back end. This guy had like yeah. nine fucking can't, turnovers can't, halfway through halfway through the second period last night. I was like, that's like the the ninth time you've turned the puck over. He can't move the puck quick enough. No. Label him he can't in move that the category. Puck at all. Yeah. yeah, like label him in that category. Like it's it's just an it's just another guy. I just wish they had a better option, but they. You just kind of have to take your pick. Which element of what guy's game do you feel is most necessary for the the way the series is going? Yeah, you're right. You you got to kind of decide. I think that's a great point. I think you got to kind of look at, okay, we're playing the Florida Panthers. We're anticipating that they come out in the first game and they want to sort of push people around like, like they did last year. So we're going to dress a lineup that we think can push back on that. Yeah. And hope that our best players can score goals. And you would think that... Joel Edmondson would be the answer because he's the biggest guy. But Florida also is like a team that four checks hard, and you got to you got to be able to move. Once you they dump that puck in, and you're the first guy back, you got to move that puck quick, or else you're getting you're getting rocked. Yeah. Speaking of lineup decisions for the playoffs, I I got to take a minute here to just give Nick Robertson some props because you know he's had a kind of a really weird tenure with this organization. They've had high expectations for him. He's gotten hurt. He's had a difficult time staying in the lineup at times. He has, like, stretches of play where he looks really small and really, like, like he doesn't necessarily fit with this group. You got to take your hat off to this guy, man. This guy, like, everyone has him circled as the guy who's coming out for Cali Yarncroc when the playoffs start. This guy has battled, and he's shown that he can shoot the puck and put the puck in the net, and... A huge issue for this team in past playoff series has been the inability to score. And so you look at guys like him and Bobby McMahon, hoping Bobby McMahon's okay, but you look at a guy like Nick Robertson and you're like, do you take this guy out? Yeah, I don't know. Like, if you, if you, I think they're going to because I think Sheldon Keefe just is in love with Kelly Yarncroft. No, he's coming in no matter what. Yeah, but I, I just think. I, I don't know. I kind of looked at their lineup last night, and I was like, this is the lineup I would start game one with. Like, uh, that fourth line with Nyes and Reeves on the wings, like, that's that's the... This, this is the, the lineup I would start game one with. Yeah, it's a Cal Yarncroft coming back in the lineup. Like it's, which, is a, which is, but what if... I don't know. You're right. And you, like you said earlier, it still applies to this. You can make adjustments as you go on through the series. But I just think, like, they just haven't... The Florida Panthers will focus all of their energy on shutting down the Leafs' top guys. So this is where you need guy, a guy like Nick Robertson to score you a big goal. And I just worry if you take him out and put Yarncroc in. It's like, yes, Yarncroc's a really great 200-foot player, but Kelly Yarncroc 
has been out with an injury for a really long time. Yeah, I know. I don't. I, I hate. I don't love. I mean, if you look at like Mark Stone and what Kucherov did, when you're like an elite player, you could take some some time off and come back and be effective. Like that's kind of what Tampa did. That's what Vegas is kind of doing. But Cali Yarncroke is is a good, nice, serviceable, responsible hockey player, but he's been out for a long time. He got hurt, and then he came back, and he got hurt immediately again. So, like, he's been out for a while, but I just... He's just one of those... He's... He's uh, what what but like Hyman was to Babcock. Like it's just like oh, yeah. yeah Keith, like Keith, Keith just loves, loves him. him. Like Keith he's just he's him. coming yeah. in. He's he's in the lineup. He's on the penalty kill. He likes him defensively, and I just I just don't see a way he comes. Like if anything, you're, you're looking at my boy twenty three coming out. If if anything, because Cal Yarncroke is a hundred percent going to be in that lineup. If he's healthy, been ready to go. Yeah, I just think I just think Keefe's taking Robertson out. If if I'm if I know Sheldon Keefe the way I think I do, I think Rob Nick Robertson's coming out, and it's too bad because I think I I tip my cap to the kid. But like you said, uh, this is a good problem to have. Like going into the playoffs, yeah. it's a good problem to have. You've got all these guys you can you can rearrange the lineup. You're right because like Connor Dewar could find a place in there. Noah Gregor could find a place Connor in Dewar there. Dewar isn't even sniffing my lineup. I'm sorry, he's not. Why? We take it out for Connor Dewar. No, no, like, one. Come I, on, I, man. I, I like, really like the idea of starting game one with this fourth line of Camp, Nyes, and Reese. Yeah, I, I really, really like that idea. I think that's that's a good. And then if if you're right, if the game goes a certain way where it's not as super rough, then you take Reeves out. And you could put some. You could put Robertson down there. You could put Dewar in there. You could put Gregor. There's, they got tons of options. Yeah, yeah. It's not. The depth is actually pretty, pretty surprising. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's it, it it's amazing how how the, I think this is the number one story of the season, in my opinion, is how brutal their depth looked like at the start of the year. Like we were just on here being like, they have no secondary scoring, they have nothing, and then at some point, when Tyler Bertuzzi started playing better hockey. And Bobby McMahon kind of scored that hat trick that one game. That's when the whole season turned around, I feel like. All of a sudden, it seemed like they had depth overnight once that started happening. It's it's funny you say that because this group of forwards, with the exception of Connor Dewar, is the same group of forwards they've had all year. It's just Sheldon Keefe has rearranged the way he deploys them. With, with the lines, and also, like you said, you've got guys contributing that weren't contributing earlier yeah. in the year. Like Tyler Bertuzzi being your top-line winger and being effective on a yeah. shift-to-shift basis completely is, is, yeah. changes the look of this team. Yeah, he was brutal. Max Domi finding chemistry with... With Austin Matthews, Max Domi getting him off the third line center sent, yeah. role, like he that. Was, How long did that go on? Oh yeah, my yeah, god, that, man, that was months of that. Of like, he's the third line center, and Keith doesn't love him, and they need to get a third line center. It's like yeah. the guy was just completely miscast. And I said all year again. I rarely pat myself on the back on this show, but I'm going to do it. I said all year, how the hell did this guy play in the top six for the Dallas Stars, a team that a lot of people are picking to win the Stanley Cup this year? And he can't he can't do it here. And you put him with you put him together with Matthews. They have chemistry. I'm telling you, man, Max Domi, after the 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 New Jersey game the other night where he set up Matthews, this guy, I think when the season's over, I don't think Tyler Bertuzzi is re-signing here. I think Bertuzzi's kind of a a journeyman in that sense. I could see him moving on to some other team, but I think Max Domi is re-signing and wants to end his career as a Maple Leaf, and people love him, and he's the son of a legend. And I'll tell you one thing, though. He cannot take a stupid penalty like he took no. last night late in a game against the Florida Panthers. That's true. That's, that's, that's true. That's one thing I will say. That's that guy's true. got a lot of pims, and he's got to be careful where he's putting a stick at the end of a hockey game. That's absolutely true. Just to point that out. Okay, Austin Matthews. I wanted to lead with this, but the conversation just dictated otherwise. Austin Matthews, 69 goals. Two games left to play. I Obviously, you play him because you want him to hit the 70 mark. I, I'm very curious to see what the vibe is going to be with the two games this week against the two Florida teams. You've got the Florida Panthers who have sort of like struggle down the stretch here. Are they going to come out and want to send a message ahead of a, a possible first round series, a very likely first round series with the Leafs? 
Or are they just going to say, we're resting because we want to be 100% for game one? And then you've got the Lightning the very uh, the very next night, who we were reminded last week, the Lightning are the dirtiest player in the game. And what are they going to be like? They're in the playoffs. Are they going to be, we're resting because we've got a big series coming up against either the Bruins or the Rangers? Or are they going to say, no, fuck you. We're going to take a piece out of you. Or the Panthers. Even. Yeah, we're going to take a piece out of you. Before the playoffs, yeah, you're just, so, well. If you look at the standings, like if Boston loses the game in hand, they have on uh, over Florida. Like Florida could be playing for first place in the division against the Leafs. Yeah. Like it's, I, I don't know how much that matters to them, really. I, I don't know, but because whoever, like, it, it seems like New York's gonna win, is gonna be playing the the shitty Metro team. So it's gonna be if you're the Florida Panthers. You want to play Tampa or you want to play Toronto? And I know the answer to that if uh, if I'm Paul Maurice. I think if you ask the Bruins that question, they'd say the same thing. But that's yeah. – honestly, if you're the Leafs, you kind of want that. This is this is a big difference this year. They are an underdog in the series this year. Like, without without question. They're, there's no favor. The expectations are still there. There's actually an article in the Hockey News this week that stated, should they have another disappointing first-round – Exit major change could be coming to the leadership with the Maple Leafs, which is something we've got all off season to talk about. But if you're the Leafs, good, underestimate us. Go in like th- that. That's where we want to be. I think this team will do much better in that sort of underdog mentality than they will in the past, where it's like, well, anything short of obviously, if they get eliminated, we're going to be disappointed. But, yeah, I'm going to be very disappointed. Yes, but I don't care how it's done. I don't care if they battle. Till the very last second, I will. There's no scenario where I'm coming on this podcast if they get eliminated in the first round and saying, like, learning lesson, like, at least they battle. Well, we're like, going to do, I, I, I gonna, can't. Hold on. We're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to do the playoff. We're going to do a playoff preview later this week. So we'll, we'll save this type of conversation for that episode. But let's talk about Austin Matthews. 69 goals, I think. What's your main thing that you think of when you look at Austin Matthews right now? I I don't know. I I don't really have like 70 is obvious. I want him to get 70. I think he's going to get 70. He's got two games to do it. I think once he got two against New Jersey, to me, it kind of cemented that he was going to get 70. And okay, so he gets 70. And and then what? Like, I I don't know. Like, it's, I I think the whole conversation of resting him is ridiculous. It's not. To me, it's not really resting him. It's like, you saw him slam into the boards last night. You could have slammed it's into the boards two hurt. weeks ago. I know, though. but it's like, it's the it's the risk of potentially getting hurt. But I think that's the fact that he's one goal away now. Th- that's not happening. Like he's playing. That is so. Why, why would you just? I, I don't. I don't know. I don't, I don't like. This isn't the. I, I don't love things. the resting conversation. I don't. It's well, no, because you want because you want you want guys to be like. Also, their last game of the season is on Wednesday. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but they're the Leafs. They're definitely playing that Saturday night, the opening night of the Stanley Cup playoffs. That's they've got Thursday, Friday, a couple days off. Here's my here's my thing with Austin Matthews. Okay, two things. One, I think we as a fan base should take a step back and just really let it sink in that there's a guy on this team who's being mentioned alongside a guy like M- fucking Mario Lemieux. Like that's. That's incredible. All the all the years that we have watched just journeyman guys come through here and just like this organization was mediocre for such a long time. Like it's had its it's had its great players, don't get me wrong, and legends, but no guy has come close to being what he's been in terms of greatness and record setting throughout the league and Hart Trophy winner and Calder Trophy winner and like like I said, like to be to be in the same conversation with one of the greatest players to ever play the game in Mario Lemieux is pretty unbelievable. That's something that I think we as a fan base need to stop and like pinch ourselves. Cause guess what? One day it's all going to be over with this group. And you and I actually, Ryan and I were golfing yesterday and we were talking about the blue Jays and how they've put the Leafs into perspective a little bit because yes, there are moments with this Leaf team where you're very frustrated and there's nights where you 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 sit and you commit to watching the game and they don't show up and it's whatever. But this is a team, yes, the playoff success has been frustrating, heartbreaking, what have you, but this is a team that for eight years in a row now 
has showed up and got it done and got into the playoffs. And there's never been, aside from the first season, which many argued they overachieved that year, they've they've been a lock to make the playoffs. Whereas, like, you watch the Blue Jays, and it's like, I said to you yesterday, I'm, I'm already out on the Blue Jays. I don't want to watch them. I don't like them. I think they're an extremely unlikable team, organization, everything. Like, get off my television. So this group gets it done year in and year out. And I think that's, we can't let that perspective fade away. Here. Okay, here's, I, I wasn't 100% prepared for that kind of ultimate Austin Matthews question. As you were speaking, here's what I'll say. He has answered the bell this season. We have criticized him on this podcast for, yes, he's an amazing player, but he just hasn't gotten to that like McDavid level kind of he 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 signed his deal i clowned on it saying it was whatever tree living said about it um doing them doing him a favor or whatever but he he's answered the bell like he really has he got his money and he's gone out and he's had a record breaking season and he's over 100 points and he's gonna be at 70 goals so for for criticizing him about not taking that next level he's he's officially hit that next level especially last year he, he was pretty mediocre last year so that is one thing i will give austin matthews he's he's answered the bell but you also just said when it someday this is going to be all over and guess what when it's all over and they ultimately did nothing all we're really going to have is another legend who didn't do anything so it's i mean it's so so the point you're making there is is they got to get it done in the playoffs yeah like it's just Yes, I, I think. Uh, listen, I I don't think anyone is arguing against that. I think. Yeah, I'm, and I'm not gonna like. He's not gonna be like. Sometimes I feel there's such goat culture in sports right now, where it's like if you don't get it done in the playoffs, people kind of like write you off in terms of your legacy when it's all over. And I don't necessarily think that's fair all the time, but for for a franchise that is just starving for playoff success like it's it's he's gonna go down as the greatest maple leaf of all time there's no doubt about it but when it's all over and you look back and and they didn't even go to like a conference final like that's that's kind of tough yeah too, so they got know? it like, they got to get it they got to get it done yeah like you get like matt's is wasn't on the level individually that that um Matthews is at, but they have there's a lot. Those, yeah. You look back at those teams, like yeah. and, and the, the some beating tough the senators, guys, but yeah. they didn't really. I mean, the, their their team had a lot of name value guys at the end, but they're all older. And you got that team to the conference final yeah. twice. Well, like, and you look back at Matt's, it's like you think of a lot of your best Matt's memories is scoring the OT winner against the Senators in the playoffs, like these great series against the Islanders and the Flyers and the Devils and the. The the sends and like yeah for sure a hundred percent agree like but I just I just it, it's you're right it's two things can be true on the one hand it's like you don't want to take for granted the fact that this guy is literally when it's all said and done could potentially eclipse Ovechkin he's on pace yeah, to do pace it. yeah Ovechkin and Wayne as the greatest goal scorers of all time yeah but you're right if you flame out in the first round like if he goes into the first round and is is a non-factor. You're going to look back and be like, yeah, that's great, but... Mm. And, and you know what? The and same... His, his be, playoff numbers aren't that great. No, either. but the same the same can be said about other guys on the team. Like, we started this episode talking about TJ Brody and how he's had a really crappy year. TJ Brody goes into the playoffs and plays well and makes big plays and whatever. No one's going to... Look at Morgan Riley last year. Morgan pretty Riley brutal. had a pretty mid regular season last year yeah. and then he was a legend in the playoffs and that's all everyone remembers right yeah. Tyler Bertuzzi like Tyler Bertuzzi in the last like month and a half two months has turned his game around but for the first I don't know three quarters of this season he was not very good but he's he's played well down the stretch he goes into the playoffs scores a big OT goal everyone will be the, the name of freaking street after him yeah one last thing I want to hit on with Matthews We've talked about this a couple of times. I was talking about it with some people on Twitter the other night, and I just, I can't, it can't be overstated that I really, really, really do applaud Sheldon for putting him with Domi and Bertuzzi because of the thing that you pointed out, which is it has unlocked a different element in his game. That line is much more north-south. They skate fast. They get the puck in. They cycle quickly. They whatever. And I think getting him away from Marner 
it's just helped with a mentality shift in the sense that like Marner is very like comes across the blue line, slow down, look for that perfect pass. Sometimes it works and it looks great, but it's all finesse with Mitch Marner. Whereas when you add Bertuzzi to that line with Domi, that line is much more likely to throw it on the net and bang in a greasy goal than it was with Mitch Marner on that line. Yeah. I mean, but uh, looking back on his career, like, Mitch Mar, I think to give Mitch Marner a little bit of credit here, there's when you look back at all the goals he scored as a Leaf, a lot of them are set up by 16. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, oh yeah. No, I no. mean, at the present moment, I don't want to see it because it's just like this thing's going, and and I just think that it's not so much about the line for me; it's about the balance. Like, I do think there's been a lot of talk about balance, and I do think that's like really important for them. I oh, do 100%. think it's so important that they don't load up a line, and I mean. I actually like the, what Keith's been doing yeah, he's been in throwing, terms of loading up a line yeah. where he's loading up the second line, where he's mm. putting Nylander up with Marner and Tavares. I think, listen, you could take what I just said as, like, negativity towards Mitch Marner and, like, keep him away, whatever. That's not necessarily how I'm viewing it. I'm viewing it from what you're saying, like a balanced perspective, but also I need Mitch Marner to take the dish cloth that is number 91 and squeeze yeah. every last drop you can get out of him. Like, that's Mitch Marner. Help John Tavares be as effective as he can possibly be in the in the first round of the playoffs. That's what that's where Mitch Marner can be such a huge help. And you know there's going to be instances where Keith sneaks him out there with Matthews as well. That's going to happen. But, yeah, I actually like that he's, he's, like, they've got, like, the super second line, too. Yeah, I mean, it's all about this lineup configuration. It's all about maximizing what you're getting out of players, too. Like, you're getting the absolute best out of Max Domi and Tyler Bertuzzi right now, and you hope that Mitch Marner playing with John Tavares brings the absolute best out of him because say what you want about John Tavares, and, like, I'm pretty done watching him as a Leaf, especially with his contract. Tell us. When, he, when he does get the opportunity, <laughs> show us. Tell us how you really feel. Yeah, when... <laughs> When he gets his, well, it's just like that contract. Yeah, like, no, it's, it's just, that's it's, the thing, yeah. right? Yeah, if John if John Tavares was a four million dollar yeah, hockey player, yeah, it'd be completely like, different. And yes. one thing you can still give John is like and he proved it against Detroit. When he gets that opportunity to shoot the puck in a good spot, he can still put it in the yeah, net. Like, right, right. Still elite down low. Yeah. Well, no, I will give up that he can. I know he's not scoring as many, he's not going to hit thirty goals this year, but. When he does get the chance, he's kind of like Nick Robertson yeah, in that yeah, sense, yeah, where can, it's like fire it in the he net, fire it in the net, yeah. and. I and mean, well, in talking about maximizing guys out of this lineup, you also could make the argument that you're not maximizing William Nylander. Oh, that was my next question for you is what have you thought of him down the stretch? Like I haven't loved him down the stretch here. And I, granted, I think he's had an all in all, he's had a pretty great year and it, he's the same thing where it's like, get in the playoffs and score some big goals. I don't care that you've kind of, yeah. Coasted. I mean, the guy, the guy's 97 points. Yeah. Like, uh, what is there to really credit? I think yeah. he's been there. Like, I, it's tough to say he's been their best player, but like, he carried the load for them at yeah. the start of the yes. season. Yes, I know Matthews had a whack at goals, but how fucking important was that guy yeah. in the first two months of the season where other guys were just awful? Yeah. Do you think? Do you think he's struggling a bit with the third line? I think the idea with putting him down there was he you can carry segment. this line. The only problem with that line is just like Pontus Holmberg. Holmberg's yeah. playing center. And I, I Pontus Holmberg is a fine hockey player, but I mean, he's yeah. like, unless Willie has his full go-go juice where he can just do it all himself, it's, I know he's Robertson on the line who's technically scoring, but I just, I don't know. He's definitely slowed down in points. It looks like he was going to kind of easily eclipse 100, but the guy's 97 points. He's had a fantastic year and I'll give him credit too. He's been thrown down on that line. And you haven't heard one report, one chirp yeah. about him complaining at all. He just goes down there. He's still Willie. You can put him out there with Ryan Reese. He's still going to be Willie. So I, I think William Nylander has had a fantastic season for this hockey team. And I, I don't really have one bad thing to say about him. Just that score is, some big goals in the playoffs. If you go back to seasons one and two of the Talking Buds Leaf Show, folks, that is yeah, this big. is a different human being sitting here. Talking yeah. about William Nylander. That's true. He's he's been. I think he's had an amazing year. I don't have one bad thing to say about him. I really don't. One thing I wanted to say that I'm really happy about is, with respect to Austin Matthews, is we no longer need to hear that he's going to sign in Arizona. <laughs> yeah, that's over. Yeah, I didn't realize that 
Can you believe how long this Arizona Coyotes thing has gone on for? This yeah, this franchise it. has been a joke. Yeah. For 10 years? Yeah. Like longer than that? Like this thing has been a joke. Gary Bettman has kept this thing on life. That's a testament to Gary Bettman for how long he kept this thing on life support and kept it going. And now they've got a guy in Utah who's just so willing to inject money into the league. They have no choice but to pull them out of Mullet Arena. One thing that uh, Freed, Friedman said on Saturday headlines on Saturday that I th- I didn't realize was it's not like they're 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 not going to be like the Utah Coyotes. Like they're they're mo- they're basically buying the team yeah, into the league yeah. and then selling it as like an expansion franchise. Mm-hmm. So it'll be a completely new. Yeah. And then Utah, they're gonna, they're whatever. Gonna give the Coyotes a chance to like oh my come God, back, man, dude. That there are few things that give me like you know me. I have strong opinions about this league and just like some of the bizarre decision making and just things they could do to make it an overall better product. Expansion is not one of them. Oh, oh. my God! And two of the two of the top. Markets now for expansion. One, Atlanta, where that's you failed ju- twice. That's a joke. You failed twice. And two, now you're gonna give a team back to Arizona. Yeah. Well, I think there's there's also Houston, Houston too. Which which is like, I don't know. Do people in Houston, Texans, Houston, Texas I mean, give a shit about You've never really hockey? heard anything bad about the Dallas market. Like Houston no. is a top well, I populated think, city in North America. So I, at least it makes sense on paper. I feel like the it's it'll be the Dallas market is kind of your typical American market, in my opinion, where it's like if the team's good and winning, the building's full, the team's doing well. If the team stinks, nobody's there. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, there's no it's just um I don't know. I like I like when stuff like this happens. You get a new team with some new unis injected into the league. What are they gonna be called? Well, I heard someone also make the argument that because of expansion and because of the watered down product and just the amount of guys that have to be in the league that that's why you're seeing all these amazing seasons. That's why you're seeing Kucherov getting a hundred assists and 150 points. And you're seeing Matthews get 70 goals because there's not enough good goaltenders, good defensemen and good forwards to fill out each roster. It's true. It's true. So it's like, because of the lack of, um, I don't know the right word, I guess lack of talent around the league. It's, it's kind of open things up for these really elite players. Yeah. Which I don't really, I, I don't care. Honestly, if my, I don't care about that, I don't want to see more teams. No. I really don't. No. It's a lot. It's a lot to follow. It's just like, that's a lot, a lot of fucking hockey teams, man. But I, also, I, I just think like the NHL in a lot of America is still very much a niche sport and you're going to have more teams in the NFL. Like the NFL has got 32 teams. Like, yeah. like we don't need more teams in the NFL. No, that's just I just think that's so, no. so silly. And the focus is on the wrong. I know they're trying to do it to inject more money into the league, which I get. But like you're at the expense of your product, which I think well, I just don't like how very mid at times. If, if, if your whole league was like if every team had a like solid fan base and just and it was like it was like we need another team because hockey's so popular and like we know it's going to do well. It's just like there's some teams in this league that are just like. I don't need to be in this league. They're not hockey markets. The building's empty. Like, I I don't know. I don't need another team. I'm good. Well, I saw someone on Twitter make a good argument for Salt Lake in that sense, where it's like they've only got – the only team they've got down there is the Utah Jazz. So it's like you, you're – like you could go to Houston and be – like you got college football. You've got the Texans. You've got the Astros. You've got whatever. Like, whereas, like, you go to Salt Lake and it's like you're a new team and – the Coyotes, like if you're basically inheriting the Coyotes franchise, they said last night they've got like a shitload of draft picks over the next two years. They've yeah. got pieces in place to be competitive pretty quickly. So, I don't know, just a little leap. I, I have no, there. I have no, I don't know anything about the Salt Lake or, no, neither market. Neither like at I. least with Vegas, it's like we've been to Vegas. We know that Vegas is Vegas. Right, so but a huge thing about Vegas is, you know what, if there's an alternate reality – where the Golden Knights stink out of the yeah. gate, and let's see what how how great that market right. is. But you could also make the like I know it kind of wasn't fair the way they got, which I I I give the Golden Knights management huge credit for like taking advantage of that and and creating an amazing team. And look how many players have gone in and out of that franchise. So they've they've done a lot to be good. But you could you could make the argument that giving your expansion team 
an advantage and the opportunity to be competitive is like the best way for it to work. Oh, for sure, hundred percent. And it's not fair to other teams that have great markets. But if you if you have an expansion team that comes in and they They're fucking terrible. suck, look yeah. at the Columbus Blue Jackets. Yeah. Like yeah. they've been. They, never, they won yeah. one big the series. Greatest, the greatest moment in the history of the Columbus Blue Jackets franchise is sweeping the Tampa yeah. Bay Lightning in round one. And other than that, like they've done nothing. Yeah. They've done nothing. You could also look at like, I mean, Minnesota have gone to a conference final. Yeah. They, but they've done nothing. They've done, and Minnesota is like a pretty, one of the better hockey markets in, in, in North America. Yeah. But yeah, it's just, I agree. I agree. It's, it's, you got to give these guys a chance to get out of the gate quick because that's the best way an expansion franchise will work. Okay. Playoffs are on the horizon. Like I said, hasn't yet been confirmed, but I think we can all assume if we can just be hockey arrogant Leaf fans here, I think we can all assume the game one will probably go Saturday night. So if we look at the week ahead, Ryan and I will be back later this week. We're going to do a playoff preview show. We're going to talk about the Leafs against either the Panthers, the Bruins, whomever. We're also going to take a look around the league and sort of give our opinions on the other series, who we like, who we don't like, and then it's post-game show time. I think with the game being on Saturday night, we'll likely be back at our usual time on Sunday morning. We'll, we'll wait and see. So what I'm saying is you will get a post-game show from the Talking Buds Leaf show one way or another after every playoff game like we've done every year. Yeah, it's the best time of year. It really is. It is the best time of year. So if you wanna if you wanna come along on this journey with us, hit that like and subscribe button below. I just have one question before we okay. leave here. Okay. okay. I'm just I'm okay, stuck on this expansion the okay. talk. Okay. All right. With like I I wish I could just like live in a fantasy world to see what it would be like if there was a second team in this city. Yeah. Like I, I think it would be very interesting. Uh, and I don't I sometimes think that people overestimate how successful it would be. Like, do you think it's like a slam dunk? I mean, if the tickets were cheaper, that yeah, if the, the blue collar fan could go to the game and it's cheaper, then I think that could be a big factor. But. So you know, here's you know who you know who I'm going to compare it to: the Chicago Cubs and the Chicago White Sox. The best thing a second team in this market would be able to do is what you just said, is make tickets more affordable. Yeah. 100%. And I think if you look at, like, I think a lot of people, if, if you live in Chicago, the Cubs are historic. They're a staple in Major League Baseball. They, everyone wants the Cubs to win. Mm -hmm. And I think, but if the White Sox go on a run, everyone's a White Sox fan. And yeah. I think that would be... That would be kind of the dynamic here. I think, I think there'd be a lot of people at first who would be like, "I'm a, I bleed blue and white. I'm a Leaf fan yeah. through and through." And then, if the team was good and had success, I think you'd see a lot more people moving over. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'll always bleed blue and white, but yes. I, I would just find it very interesting if they, if they were more affordable tickets. The barn was rowdier. Yes, yes. The atmosphere was better. I think if and you, they started having some success, yeah. like I think it'd be very interesting. I think if you're in a new ownership group, that would have to be your priority at least to start. The problem is, is would it stay that way, especially with all the money that's available in this market? Like you look at why Scotiabank Arena, uh, the, the dullest atmosphere on earth most nights, because it can be, because tickets are so expensive. Yeah. So many, it's all corporate in there. It's all white collar. Like we talked either the last episode or the one before about the game in Buffalo and just how incredible that was. So yeah, it, it I don't know if we'll ever see it in our lifetime, but I think I, but it's the, still funny if, if the league's goal is to inject more money, that's Gary is so adverse to having another expansion team in Canada. I, I don't, I don't buy, like I don't buy Quebec city. Like if you're going to put a team in Quebec city, Put in another team in fucking Toronto. Yeah. Like, I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, like, why would you have two teams in Quebec and, and have one team in, in Toronto? I, I, that is, well, that I mean, doesn't you got make two in Ontario with the Sens, but the Sens are the Sens. Yeah. yeah well, like, to me, like, Ottawa is, is... I relate Ottawa to kind of Montreal more than I relate it to Toronto. Yeah. But you can also see it like they come here, they have an expansion team here, they're awful, and then they just get clowned on, and everyone just makes fun of them. So, I don't know. I just... I would love to just kind of like have an alternate reality. It would be such an interesting too. Like, work. what would they call? Like, again, I I I liken the um, 
And the White Sox have been around for a long time, but like the Cubs are the Cubs, right? Yeah. And so it's like I liken it to that. Where it's the like, White Sox have won a World Series, yes, yes. and they had some good teams, and yes. like, like they played the Jays in the early nineties. Yeah. Like they've had some success. So yeah, I. But it's like the, the the Leaf logo and the Leaf brand is so steeped in history and tradition. Yeah, and I think I think, yeah. It'd be interesting. Yeah, I just I hypothetical, just, yeah. but it would be it'd interesting. Be, it'd be a fun conversation to kind of sit back and think of like all the pros and cons of how that would work and how that wouldn't work. Okay. Anyway. Well, like I said, hit the like and subscribe button below. We'll be back. Post game shows, playoff preview show, the content. We've had people comment saying we need more content. Well, you're gonna get it starting this week. So come along for the ride with us. Spread the word, tell your friends. We really appreciate it. If you're listening to the Audio version, leave a little review. Every little bit helps. We want to get those audios no, audio numbers up, too. The YouTube numbers have been off Someone the charts. Someone did drop a review on Apple. Yeah? Yeah. We uh, w- the, the YouTube numbers have been off the charts awesome. We want to get the audio numbers up there as well. So if you can give us a hand with that, that would be really great. We'll see you guys later this week for the playoff preview.